Are you angling for a main site visit? <laughs> I, yes, I would love that. <laughs> but I mean, Scott, can, can Matt come to your house and and daily and hang out in your bedroom at night to open and close windows? <laughs> yeah, you, you and your wife won't mind, I'm sure. Yeah, I need to map your uh, prevailing winds. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. Today, I am joined by Robert Yegid, Esquire. Hey, Justin. And a new addition to our team here, Mr. Matt, should I say Millam or Milham? Milham, I guess. Milham. Yeah. It's British, right? Yeah, it is. So Matt is our newest staff editor. Um, he's about, what are we, two months in now? Yeah, it will be at the end of this month. Yeah, well, <laughs> so so one and a half months. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, we're 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 breaking Matt in. We decided to throw him to the wolves and uh, bring him to the podcast. Let's just before let's just consult the eight ball here Go on for the it. table and see. Uh, will Will Matt have a good first podcast? Mm. Oh, it's teetering on so it shall be. And yes, is it is it even possible to have a broken eight ball? <laughs> It's not a good sign. I don't, I don't think it's a good sign. Both sound pretty positive. If there though. would be a yeah. broken A-ball, it would be in our... <laughs> Matt rigged it. It would be yeah, on top got of in here. our table here. So it looks like Matt's going to have a good podcast. Um, we're going to be talking about a bunch of stuff from ventilation, uh, in you know summer summer upstairs ventilation to uh, OSB versus plywood, and also insulating rim joists. Um, All good stuff. Yeah, no attic ventilation this time. Well, I'm sure we can sneak it in. Yeah, we'll sneak it in we'll there. We'll sneak it in there. Boy, you nerds can talk about insulation. That was one of the comments we got. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to just, you know, kind of formally introduce Matt and have him give us a little bit of his his background because he's fresh out of building school. Yeah, that's right. I went to uh, State University of New York at Delhi. Uh, it's a college that has a bunch of different programs, but uh, the building trade stuff is kind of maybe not their biggest thing but one of their biggest things and yeah yeah so i was in their residential construction program so i mean you've worked for a couple other builders in addition to going to school for it yeah so i came back to the states from where i was living uh before yeah, after what was it 10 years in the army uh eight years in the army and yeah a few more years after that working for the department of defense in yeah. various capacities and uh yeah i had uh, the GI Bill had some free school, so yeah. I came back to the states to uh, basically go to college for building, and ended up picking up with a straw bale builder in the Catskills. First thing when I got back, that was about super relevant. Yeah, about a week and a half after I got <laughs> nice. back to the states. Uh, so yep. that was pretty. Uh, that was a really interesting introduction to the building trades. Um, <laughs> I know it's not. I it's bet. way outside. Just the, really quick for people who don't know what a straw bale house is, can you explain it for? Them? Yeah. So you uh, build a frame. It's like essentially sort of like a timber frame, and then you infill with actual bales of straw, and then you cover that in a stucco. <laughs> Uh, in this case, we were using uh, basically like a Portland and lime stucco that went on both the inside and the outside. So, so that provides so the, the 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 timber frame provides all the structural concern. Uh, yeah, Except most for, of it, and then you have shear panels at the corners. Okay, I was going to yeah, say yeah, and then the uh, the you know the cement or the the stucco itself provides quite a bit, as does the straw. I mean, you know, they're. <laughs> What fourteen inch thick walls? It comes out to about an R thirty seven. So it's a pretty robust Wild. system. Yeah. How do you tie the straw bales together? Uh well, <laughs> the stucco does a lot of it. You just kind of interlace them, stack them, sort of like bricks. And in some parts, you uh, cover it in metal lath. A lot of it, you just put the stucco right on the right on the bales, though. Do you stucco? Do you put stucco between the bales, like like it's as if it's you're laying bricks? No, you just stuff the <laughs> heck out of them with more straw. So you try to fill any gaps with more of the same stuff. What an odd! It is pretty wild, isn't it? It's a wild. It's a wild way to build. No, uh, yeah, but they look so cool when they're done. Yeah, you yeah. love that kind of. Uh, I think we talked about it briefly, but you love that kind of natural, natural architecture. I guess we yeah. could call it. Yeah, actually, the guy I ended up working for was uh, a guy I had read about um, before I decided to go to school for this. So it was sort of like doubly exciting, and I just sort of happened into it. I didn't, you know, seek him out or anything like that. It was just it, complete serendipity. So it was. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it was really neat. So how did you find? Um, going to building school i mean do you feel like you really from what I, I guess i didn't know what to expect i didn't ever went to building school but when we hired you and we started poking at it a little bit or just kind of what's coming up in conversation like even even yesterday we were talking about well 
we really we were working on something for the magazine, and we were talking about dew points, and we really got to make sure that in this illustration of you know where the outdoor temperature and indoor temperature meet in terms of the R value of the wall, that the dew points in the right place, and Matt goes, well, you know, let me pull out the psychrometric chart, and you know the way I learned to read it is it's like, I, I didn't even know you could learn that in school. Never mind being like an engineer, but so it sounds like it's pretty comprehensive. Yeah, this particular program was. I can't speak for anything other than the one I was in. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we had a couple guys who were, you know, deep into that stuff. Who uh, one guy who's passive house certified and just, you know, like f- just trips all over himself to get his hands on the latest chart. Just yeah. loves all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mr. Brownell, hi. And uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so it, it was. It covered a lot of stuff. I mean, you start out just doing, you know, uh, framing and then you move on to finish and then you're doing, you know, energy efficient construction and cabinet building and remodeling. So you know anything going in? Can you be, can you be completely? Yeah, completely. No, nothing. I mean, I would say probably close to half the kids had been through, there's a program in New York called BOCES, which is basically like vocational high school. So a lot of kids had gone through that. So they had some background, but probably the other half, yeah, had never swung a hammer. They teach you everything. For, and it sounds like from what I've heard you overheard you in different conversations talking about it, sounds like it's pretty up to date. I mean, it's not like they're teaching you to build a house in 1950. No. Like they're teaching you about energy efficiency and the way moisture moves and, and vapor barriers and, and yeah. how to think like a modern day builder, right? Yeah. They're trying to teach you the right way basically from the beginning, you know, everything is to code and, you know, like the way that you should be doing things, not like, you know, quick shortcuts to, you know, build a production house. Although, you know, a lot of those guys probably will go off and and work for production builders. Um, You know, they're trying to set you up. They really want to set you up almost to like even be able to run your own business. I mean, there's even classes on that. So, so two year program. Yeah. Two year program. Super cool. And it's uh, say it again, it's a university of New York or yeah. State university of New York at Delhi. So it's D L D E L H I. Yep. You get to live in the wonderful world of Delhi, New York. Yeah, it's a very where, small where is town. that? That is in the far western Catskills. Um, it's supposedly the county seat, but I would say it's maybe three thousand people, um, and that's not mostly in town. That's like you know, sort of like the surrounding area. I mean, there's farms right outside of town. So cool. Yep. That's super cool. Yeah. Well, we're gonna see if you if you learned anything at school today. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Apparently, they found out yesterday that we we were, as we were talking about that thing with the the dew point, we were pulling up articles and referencing a couple things. Like, well, here's how we define dew point before. Let's just make sure that we're saying it the same way now. And blah blah. blah. And, and Matt's like, were you wrong? And, and Matt goes, uh, Matt, go- oh, no, we weren't wrong. But <laughs> but Matt goes, oh yeah, we we read that uh we read that article in school. I read that one. And I'm like, oh no! And then you know, art director Bob's in the room. He's like, yeah, see. And make sure we get this stuff right. You got kids in school learning it. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, we've got a few questions to go through today, and they're they're fairly they they could be fairly long long ish. They have the potential to be long ish discussions. So I just want to give them all the time we can give them. But if anybody has any questions. For us, for future shows or topics you'd like to hear us discuss, you can send us a note at fhbpodcast at taunton.com. Um, and uh, so the first question comes from Catherine. Uh, and I actually stole this question and put it in. Um, Catherine's a friend of mine, and she asked me this question directly. And I, I said afterwards, boy, this would be a really nice one for the podcast, especially since it somewhat relates to Rob's project that he did in his basement. Um, she just bought a new house. Uh, the fiberglass bats used to insulate our basement rim joist, in her words, I think that's the term for the space between the basement ceiling and masonry walls, right? And yes, Catherine, you're right. That's that's what it is. Um, they're in shabby shape and look like they've been home to mice over the years. We'd like to consider upgrading to spray foam and got a quote of $900 to have it done for us. Is it necessary to even hire a professional for this work, though, or can we consider doing it ourselves? Um, so there's there's a lot of layers to talk about here first. Why don't we first first back up that she, she is correct that is the rim joist so the rim joist is uh it's the sometimes called the band joist how did you learn in school band or rim matt uh they told us both yeah damn yeah. i can never get a straight answer on that we prefer rim here at the magazine yeah, yeah. uh it's in our style guide it's our style guide <laughs> we don't we don't identify with the band joist yeah okay we're okay. I mean, a part of that crowd so it's a rim joist insulation um so that's the the board that essentially runs around the outside of your floor frame and the whole purpose of it is to provide racking resistance for your floor really it keeps the keeps the floor joists from rolling over and falling down um it's a notoriously leaky spot in terms of energy efficiency uh yeah, you've got a lot of uh joints and seams there yeah uh, between the 
top of the foundation wall and the mud sill, the, the joint between the mud sill and the rim joist. And, yeah. Sheathing, so there's lots of holes to be sealed, and which is being accomplished with fiberglass bats. And there's a rim joist between your basement slash crawl space and first floor. Um, if you don't, if you have a slab, this is not an issue for you. Uh, but there's all it, it will be an issue for you if you have a second floor because there's also a band joist between your first floor and your second floor. Uh, the one between the first floor and second floor is harder to deal with because it's likely covered with drywall unless you live in a, a very special house. Uh, but the one in the basement or crawl space is usually easy pickings for uh, it's low hanging fruit in terms of upgrading the energy, energy efficiency of your house. So um, most builders shove bat insulation in there. Uh, you know they're already insulating the floors, so they cut off pieces that are sized to fit in that space and they shove them in there. But there are some problems with that. Uh, yeah, let's quiz Matt. Matt, do you know what the problems with bat insulation are? Well, I mean. <laughs> where to start uh it's <laughs> <laughs> you don't get any kind of like air sealing there yep. so i mean everything's just kind of going through and the issue that she's having with the mice or whatever i mean that's a huge one for me it's um, a, it makes a nice mouse nest yeah it's a nice comfy spot for a mouse to live yeah so i mean there's potential for damp there's potential for you know all kinds of other mouse related disease issues or just you know lack, it's just unhealthy well wow, matt's afraid of mice Oh, yeah. I have a huge mouse issue <laughs> in the Catskills. <laughs> Traumatized. Right? Matt, had a, Matt had a bear living in his rim joist. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the, the general rule of thumb here to answer this question is that you you want to have the same same amount of insulation. So insulation is measured by R value, and you want to have the same R value on your rim joist as you have in your walls above it. So if your walls are R15, you want your rim joist to be at least R15. Um, that's kind of a, a good rule anywhere. You that know, continues all the way up the wall. All the way up the wall. And I think that's something that people could or should keep in mind when kind of, I guess, designing or even remodels, considering their assembly, is that you don't want any kind of, not pinch points, but weak points within your thermal band or sure. just like your air barrier. So, for instance, at the rim joist, you want a consistent or um, a similar R value, R value to your walls. But the same is true above your top plates. We hear that when you're insulating an attic or a roof. And that's you should spot always strive. usually gets pinched. Yeah, you, sh you always kind of strive for a consistent thermal boundary. So what happens there, to, to elaborate on Rob's, at the top of the wall where your roof rafters land, um, there's, you know, the, you, have, you cut the rafters to sit on that top plate. And often the vertical height from the top plate to the underside of the roof deck is, is shrunk enough to the point where you can't get insulation in there very tight. Add in the fact that you then have ventilation baffles there and it, yeah. It's a big weak spot in terms of the insulation. That's why lots of people who build with trusses spec raised heel trusses. Yeah, raised heel trusses are awesome. Yep. Would you do trusses on the next house if you did it, you think? Oh, yeah, for sure, because the next house I build is just going to have nothing in the attic and just boatloads of insulation on the attic floor. So it'll be all trussed out. It'll just be trusses. It's going to be an A-frame, just trusses sitting just on trusses a slab. On, yeah, trusses <laughs> on a slab. They could probably build that. They could do some crazy stuff Yeah. with trusses. Yeah, ski chalet Yeah. with a 28-pitch roof. Um, so, so if you're going, you could use bats for this job. It's totally fine. I know that, you know, Catherine was talking about, uh, you know, worrying about mice and, um, sure that, that could be a concern. Uh, I'm sure you're going to have less problem with mice if you, if you air seal and, and take time to seal things up nicely first, they're going to still seem to always find a way in, but it will help. Um, so if you want to use bats and that could be fiberglass bats it could be uh, mineral wool whatever you want i like mineral wool because it's it's shaped and firm so that you can just kind of push it into place and it holds its shape and fills up all the gaps and cracks and stuff but if you're going to use bats you have to first air seal so the options there the the lowest option there is going to be to use canned spray foam to just kind of do the perimeter of each rim joist bay um and then you know between the masonry and the and the the mud sill, and just kind of visually look for that. That's not the best. You could use sealant too, caulks and acoustical sealant. Caulk works as well. The acoustical sealant is extremely messy, mm -hmm. so just be aware of that. Um, uh, the the next best option would be to use like rigid foam. The cut and cobble approach. Cut and cobble. So, so that's cutting little rectangles and kind of force fitting them and again sealing those around their perimeter with uh, either can spray foam or sealant. And are we okay with any kind of rigid foam in this spot? 
Um, I believe so. I, I, I believe so as so well. So long as, so long as you hit that R value. Do we, are we all so. turning our missile keys? Yeah. I, I just I like close cell, maybe low expanding just so it doesn't blow it out. But So that would be a poly ISO. Rigid? Oh, for the We're rigid. talking for rigid. Rigid, oh, yeah. rigid, yeah. Um, would you really... Okay, so you could use bad insulation here, but would you really recommend that? N no, I'm just trying to simply give options here. Sure. If the, the, the way to do this... The best way to do this is to spray, is spray foam. The best way to insulate just about anything is spray foam. It's just whether... Then, then you balance that against your your relationship with spray foam and, <laughs> and the environment and, yeah. and that kind of stuff, uh, you know, has high, higher global warming potential. Some builders, some, some green builders avoid it completely at all costs um, because of the off gassing and all sorts of other stuff like that. Uh, but in terms of its performance, it sticks to everything. It fills up all nooks and crannies and gaps. It provides R value and air sealing in one shot. Um, it's expensive is the problem, and it's messy. Uh, it, there are some reports that you can have off-gassing problems like fish odors that you can't get rid of. That's more rare, yeah. but it is something. Um, we can talk more about spray foam in a second, but if you're not going to do spray foam and you want to do it yourself, you can do the cut and cobble approach, which I would then argue is, I don't know what, 85% as good? I mean, is that is that fair? I mean, if you're doing a diligent job and you're really careful with it, yeah, could you not I mean, get to the same spot? You're going to get the benefits of foam, but it's the most, I think, economical and feasible way to do it yourself. It's essentially half the price. Uh, as, opposed to, as opposed to trying to get some of those two-part, the smaller compact two-part kits of spray right. foam, like Tiger Foam, yep. um, which my understanding is they <laughs> don't have great capacity. They're ultra expensive. You'll probably end up spending more money on those kits than you would just having the pro come in and spray this in an hour. Um, so if you will, I, yeah, if you were committed to doing that yourself, just do the cut and cobble approach with Richard Foam. Well, yeah. so we don't have this, the square footage of the basement, you know, the linear footage of the of the rim joist, but nine hundred dollars doesn't seem ridiculous. No, to it me. seems that like seems... that should be the route you should take. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's not that much more than that kit would be yes. to buy it, yeah. and it, it's just so much safer to have somebody else come in and do it. Right. So the kit is going to cost you. So basically, the the what we're talking about with the kit is it looks like two propane tanks like two grill propane tanks. There's a part A and a part B. They give you like 15 feet of plastic hose, and then that connects to a little gun. So one tube connects to each of the tanks. Um, they run Both hoses run to the gun, and then the gun mixes it as you spray. Um, and if everything goes well and everything's mixed right and everything is the right temperature, you should theoretically have a good mix. Um, and then the uh, it, but if you don't, you can get into this part A rich or part B rich, and the foam might not perform the way you want. So there's there's some hazards there. We can throw up an article on this. Patrick and I did did an article on this a few years ago called uh, "Spray Foam for the Rest of Us," and we we did a whole evaluation of these kits to kind of get a feel for are there differences between brands and how how feasible is this as a project yourself? And um, typically they're sold by the board foot. Which, for people who don't know what that is, is one board foot is is um, one square foot of material at one inch thick. So if you know that you want um, one inch of spray foam and your cavity is roughly 12 inches square, then that's a board foot. Um, the kits we tested, I think, were 600 board feet or something like that. And it and it, they were the larger ones. And it came out to, you know, the prices varied. There's like, there was like six companies at the time, I think, that were making them, six or seven, something like that. Tiger Foam was one of them. Um, and it was roughly, it varied a little bit, but roughly a dollar a board foot. Um, so, so if we do apples to apples, it would be, let's say, 50 cents a board foot for rigid foam if you wanted to do it yourself, a buck a board foot if you use these, do-it-yourself kits and then you know so the biggest do-it-yourself kit you're going to buy is 600 ish mm -hmm. board feet so it's going to cost you 600 ish bucks or you can pay 900 bucks let's call it apples to apples 900 bucks and you don't have to do anything and somebody does it all for you right which is <laughs> pretty nice pretty, pretty appealing nice. yeah uh, if you are going to do it yourself with with the kits um you should know uh that you have to consider some factors like the temperature um this, these are all things that we didn't particularly know 
until we started researching this article, Patrick and I, um, you get the spray foam guys take into account a lot of stuff. They're, first of all, they're trained for this. They understand how to manipulate the foam. They understand how thick you can apply it. If you put it too thick in one go, it will peel off of the surface that you're spraying it onto. If the surface you're spraying it onto is too cold, it won't stick. Uh, if, um, uh, what was the other thing? Um, they, they know how to uh, control the mess a little better. Uh, one lesson Rob learned is how important it is to have super solid communication with where you want them to be spraying and where you don't, right? Like, what would you do? Because you had... Oh, no. No, I, I communicated rather <laughs> clearly where I did not want foam placed. I even... I, I even like marked out areas like with spray paint, like, you know, like yeah. keep this, you know, joist bay open because I'm going to have some rough plumbing coming in. And so they sprayed on everything that I told them not to spray and didn't spray where I told them to spray. Yeah. <laughs> so Maybe they were confused by your paint. I think they were confused by the, there was a little bit of a lack well, of communication. More than likely the person spraying the foam is not going to be the same person that walked into your basement and said, this is going to no. be $900. No. So maybe the day of you want to be home and just do one last walkthrough with the guy that's going to be holding the gun. Well, that's the thing too, is that you're not going to be on site when they're there. So, um, you know, they ask you to kind of leave the house. In some cases you should leave the house for 24, 48 hours because yep. there's going to be some off gassing, <clears throat> um, initially. Um, so yeah, you're not going to be able to like, you know, hop in there and, and inspect like while they're applying it, yep. um, unless you're totally kitted up. Um, with a respirator, Matt can tell us what respirator to be using. Yeah, we can but, dig um, into that. That's a whole. But uh, yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah, it just comes down to communication. Hopefully, they listen. Here's the thing: they don't always listen. Now though. that we've given all those options, long pause. Yeah, this is like dramatic. I thought we, I thought we solved it. Well, we didn't. Well, now that we've given all the options in a fair and balanced way, I would like to, I would like to lay my opinion down here. Um, I. Having used these kits, I can tell you a couple of things about them. One, the yield is pretty – it may not be exactly what what they list on the can. They're expensive to buy. Then you have to pay for shipping. They're really hard to dispose of appropriately if you want to. Like it, they, they will tell you on the cans like, yeah, you just bring them down to – it's one of those classic brush-offs. Like make sure you re recycle this you know, responsibly. And then you take it down. We took ours to the local dump and we asked for help and they were like, we don't want these things. We can't – you can't put those here. We, we have no place for these. Like go find somewhere else to dump them. It was like we're driving around with like all these containers that we can't do anything with. Um, also in Matt's research recently on respirators, and we'll have you back on the show again when that article is out so that we can talk in more detail about, you know, some tips on how to choose the right respirator. But what we essentially found out is you should not be spraying spray foam unless you have a, a, essentially a respirator that's, that's bringing in outside air through a tube. Yeah, either supplied air or SCBA, which is basically like scuba gear for the land. Right, put a tank on your back. Yeah. Otherwise, you're pretty much not protecting yourself against this. Yeah, and in doing a little prep for this, I mean, I just started, I looked at, like, the uh, safety data sheets for a bunch of different spray foams, and, I mean, it says <laughs> right in this stuff. I'll just read it. Uh, if concentration levels exceed exposure limits, use a NIOSH-approved air purifying respirator equipped with an organic vapor cartridge and particle filter, which is what they're going to tell you to do when you buy this, you know, this thing. Um, but it says uh, employers are required to implement a cartridge, blah, blah, blah. If concentration levels are unknown or extremely high, use a positive pressure self-contained breathing apparatus. And it's, they're going to be unknown. Right. So it's basically telling you from the beginning, spend $2,000 on scuba gear. So that's going to be more expensive than, than the job itself. I have right. to. Just I get have it to, contracted out. I have to admit, one of the beyond just not following directions, the, the people that uh, did my basement, sprayed my basement, I was pretty concerned at the lack of uh, safety precautions that they took. I, you know, I wasn't on site. I came home at some point just to see what was going on. Just Found them peeing on your lawn. It was like, uh, yeah, <laughs> whatever. Um, but they had a fan, you know, a fan um, hooked up to a long tube that so that they were insulating the basement. So they had that tube running up and out the back door to try to exhaust some air. And I thought, I took a peek down there, and I thought I saw one of the helpers just standing down there hanging out without, like, any protective equipment on whatsoever. And it was like, I mean, you could smell this stuff, like, just, like, if you were, like, on my property, let alone, like, just waiting for your buddy to 
finish oh, yeah. up down. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's unfortunate that even on some of the pros that they're not either the employers aren't really taking care of their guys or they just don't know. Yeah. You know? Well, that's so, I mean, just, just to kind of explain that a little scary fact about the fact about having to have, if you hire somebody to spray, spray, spray foam, other than the people that Rob hired, um, they I'm not going to mention who they, they are. Will typically I should though. They will typically be wearing full coveralls and a, a full face mask respirator, and it's it's not really a respirator, right? It, I mean, is it still technically a respirator? It's still technically a respirator, but it, it's not cleaning the air around you. It's yes. getting air from somewhere else. It's clean air. There is no filter that's no. going to protect you in that basement no, with and, that spray foam. Right, and in enclosed spaces when you're spraying spray foam, I mean, any contractor is probably going to be using either supplied air or SDBA. Um, and the reason for that is because the, the one component – of spray foam is so bad for you that like it, you can become sensitized and basically have like a, you know, like either an asthma attack or the chance of having an, an asthma attack in the future yeah. from, you know, relatively low exposures to this right. stuff. And if you can smell it at all, you've already been overexposed. That's basically what even 3M says in, in their literature. So they, they recommend like just going automatically with a supplied air respirator. Yep. Don't even bother with the stuff that's recommended in these, in these dumb kits. And, and this is really important, not just for this question, but we're bringing it up also because, you know, a lot of guys hire people to spray, spray their projects, you know, and maybe you're like popping in to see their progress. Don't pop in to see <laughs> their, like, yeah. mm-hmm. you have no respirator in your arsenal that allows you to walk into that room with them, period. Yeah. Not safely anyway. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and not, don't mess with like these. We're not joking around. These chem, these chemicals are gnarly. I mean, it, take it from a different perspective. When when uh, another of our editors, Andy Engel, did research on different caulks and sealants, he dug pretty deep into like polyurethane sealants, which is the basis of the spray foam. It's polyurethane spray foam. And he walked away from researching that article being like, I'm pretty much never buying polyurethane adhesives anymore this stuff is so bad for you that i don't even want it on my skin wow like 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 really bad for you stuff so just throwing it out there if anybody else is concerned they can shoot us an email we'll hook you up with the stuff that we we found on that but um it seems like a real thing to worry about not like a a frivolous thing to worry about yeah it's not like painting it's not like you can yeah you can do it yourself and do a pretty good job and you're not at any risk it's not like that at all yeah i i I would have i would have if it was me, I would have somebody. If and I, and I really wanted to do the spray foam route, I wouldn't have any problem with putting rigid foam and sealing the perimeter right. of the rigid yeah, yeah. foam. I, I mean, I did that in my house. I've done it on a lot of other projects. It, it's effective. It's slow, and you got to work at it. But you save a lot of money. Whatever. Um, if you're going to have it sprayed, I would not be in the house. I would be gone for 24 hours. Just eliminate the worry. What for else? sure. You say something else. Uh, I was just going to ask if you had any tips for cutting rigid foam. How do you like to get rigid foam? Oh, man, I've tried so many ways. Have you tried the uh, sharpening the putty knife? Yes, I've done the I've done sharpened that. putty knife. I've done the corrugated, or, you know, the serrated bread knife. Yep. Um, I actually have, uh, I bought a circular saw blade that was made for cutting foam. Seems excessive, but no, it was. Did it work out? And I wanted to try it for the magazine. Yeah, yeah. It was great. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's super like, thin, curved, or yeah, it doesn't really have any blades on it. It's just like it looks like a. Uh, I can't remember the brand name of it. I posted it on my Instagram back when we were uh, back when I was trying it out. But it was it looks sort of like a fiber cement cutting blade where it had like four gullets mm-hmm. instead of like twenty four, and. I don't remember if it had. I don't think it had carbide teeth, and it was shaped somewhat different. The whole point is that it is basically melting its way through, but it, in such a clean way. Yeah. Um, and I, I used a shooting board, you know, just made a, a plywood shooting board cool. and just it just cut right through. It was awesome. I mean, it had a little bit of that kind of burning foam smell. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that and, uh, you know, a handsaw. Uh, table saw. Know. Yeah, table, table saw. saw if you're outside. And that you can use a respirator for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Nobody knows which respirator, though. Uh, all right, let's move on. Uh, okay. Stephen writes, we're looking to put an addition onto our house in Michigan. And while discussing details and getting bids, I started to wonder about your guys' thoughts on OSB versus plywood. I know lots of builders using the zip system in Vantech nowadays, which are both OSB. And I'm wondering, has that bias against quote unquote flake board finally passed and become a non-issue? This is a really interesting question because, you know, years ago, 
there was such a huge backlash against OSB that it was like, oh, that stuff's garbage. Never use it. It's nothing but problems. And now, like the leading, the leading sheathing companies, pro- the one I see most often is is, is Zip, and, and people put Advantech down and swear by it. So it's it's funny to see how it has swung back. Um, so what do you guys think? Well, I think there's a big difference between Zip and your regular OSB. I mean, so if you're going with a Zip option i mean you can leave that exposed for i think what do they say like a year i don't yeah. know i know i mean I, I know people have done it they've even done it on roof decks and just put the tape on it and it holds up yeah fantastically um but as far as like you know regular osb or plywood i think the issues are probably very similar in that you would need to get it you know covered dried in relatively well, yeah i think it just comes soon. down to Exposure and not, well, I mean yeah. moisture exposure. We should back up and we should just for people who don't understand the difference between the two products. Maybe we should between OSB and plywood. Plywood, yeah. Hmm. All right, go way back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, <dude>. all right. <laughs> Rob's upset that we're going this far back. Everybody should know. Uh, well, yeah, bring him up to speed. OSB stands for Oriented Strand Board. It's essentially um, the difference between the two is picture plywood as you take a giant log and you peel it, you roll it along this big cutting knife and it peels off a long continuous layer you then take those continuous layers and you lay them perpendicular to each other one after the other and you know stack them up and glue them together and then you cut it into sheets it also bond them with an insane amount of heat and pressure and all that stuff and that's how they make plywood so it's long continuous carvings slices of wood veneers veneers osb is oriented strand board and that takes the same concept of orienting them perpendicularly for strength except instead of long slices of of wood they use little tiny flakes and chips the 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 reason for that is that they can they can use uh trees that are not ideal for slicing you know they can use smaller pieces they can use smaller trees different kinds of trees different species um they can mix all different species together it's whatever um but because of this difference in the way that these products are made they behave differently so that's what kind of what we're talking about uh, the big complaint with flake board when it first came out um is that it would get wet and all those little they didn't they didn't really seem to have that the adhesive and wax content kind of figured out in osb back then and if it got wet it would kind of flake and pull would, apart and it would swell it would for s- sure it would swell and but both products swell both products get wet actually plywood gets wet more easy it absorbs water faster and more easily and dries faster and dries faster that's the thing about plywood is it because it's got those long thin veneers they're essentially retaining all that cellular structure so it will like soak up water and draw it all the way across the panel pretty quickly and efficiently and then when it dries out it will kind of go back to its original shape and size so builders are like well this is the greatest thing ever it's super resilient it's reliable they also like that it nails better typically and get nails kind of go through and it doesn't splinter. It doesn't blow through. And, um, yeah. I, I, so I read that plywood will kind of, um, shrink back to I get roughly its original size as right. opposed to like when OSB swells, it swells and it doesn't go back. But I've seen some pretty bad looking <laughs> plywood oh, after yeah, it's too. gotten wet. Like, like you need to replace it, you yeah. know? Um, and, and this is, so that's what sort of, all these rumors are are based in reality. I mean, it's not – this is not – but it's not that simple, I guess, is the answer. Like, not all OSB is made out of the same type of wood. Not all OSB has the same mixture of resins yeah. and glues and whatever so, else. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Wax. so, the, you know, Huber, for instance, that Advantex is bomb-proof, seemingly. Like, they've just figured out the right whatever resins or wax to make it um, really water-resistant. Um yeah, again, for a subfloor, like if you're on a new construction, that the exposure for that Advantech is, I forget it, but it's months for sure. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? It could get wet and it's, it's not going to swell. It's warranty. Yeah. But then, and you can do the same thing. There's there's versions of plywood subfloor that are super treated and they have, um, you know, special cutouts to drain water between sheets and, and leave room for expansion <clears> with, <throat> with tongues that are designed to, to create an expansion gap and blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, there's a lot of, technology going into making these panels super durable the other thing you have to consider is that a sheet of plywood is not a sheet of plywood you know it's 
well, it is, but not every sheet of plywood is a sheet of, is the same as the other sheets of plywood. Um, there's exposure ratings that go with them. You know yeah. how how much weather they're they're intended to. I mean, be able to withstand. I think, I think it kind of comes down to a, a, like a lot of other things in building, just using the right product for the right job. You know. Yeah. Um, is there bias mm-hmm. against OSB? Yeah, for sure. When it's used as sheathing and it's going to be exposed to the weather, and you haven't gotten house wrap on it for whatever reason, you know. Um, but I used just regular old OSB subfloor in my attic because it was there was zero chance of it getting wet. I used OSB subfloor in my shop, and it's exposed. It's just yeah. two layers of half-inch OSB perpendicular to each other, screwed together over my slab, and I have beat the snot out of that floor. And it there's it's like you can still see the painted lines on it. I remember when Brian was going to use OSB for some finished product. He he got on this kick where he liked the look of OSB, the industrial look of it. So he decided to sand off the painted guidelines on there and use it for a finished floor. He's like, I couldn't even sand it. He couldn't even. It just wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> so um, OSB will typically save you some money if you get the commodity. If you're comparing, like, budget OSB to budget plywood, it's going to be – OSB is going to be cheaper. Yeah. It's like 9 bucks a sheet right now, at least in Connecticut. Hmm. It's pretty cheap. Uh, yeah. Um, just check the – span ratings and all that and make sure you're you know, comparing apples to apples. Well, that's the thing too. So from a structural standpoint, to answer this, Stephen's question, it's the same. It has to meet the same span requirements, well, well, the same structural requirements that has to be evaluated by either the APA or TECO are the two kind of governing bodies for that. And they'll have a stamp on there and the stamp will give you two numbers separated by a slash. And the first number, if I remember, if I remember this right, first number is the spacing between it Framing members? Yeah, for uh, roofs and walls. Right, and then the second number is the... Um, floors. Okay, gotcha. Yep. So it's flo- roofs and wall, and then slash floors, okay. Um, and it'll also have um, its durability rating on there, which for for exterior, well, for building a house, let's say, which is going to get wet while you're building it, uh, it's either, you're either going to want, well, you're going to want exposure one, which expo- it goes exposure one and then exterior, Exterior is like if you buy a siding panel, which, by the way, also OSB. You can get what is that? Who's that? LP that makes that. I believe you can so. get that. You know, T one eleven kind of stuff, and that's OSB, and it's siding. It's mm-hmm. just got an exterior rating on it, so it's fine. It's so that you can't just make a blanket statement. I guess is the point. Um, you can make either one of these work. We can throw up this article we have from from years ago that was pretty comprehensive on this stuff. Um, I think it's just called plywood versus OSB, isn't it? I believe so. And yeah. we'll, we'll put the link on finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. All right. We got one more from Scott. Main summers are wonderful, but the upstairs of my Cape style house is hot and stuffy. I run both bathroom fans that are about 100 CFM each during the night to cool the house, but it's not enough. To get more cool air into the house, I've considered boosting the bath fans to 150 CFM or more or installing an attic fan. Which option do you guys think is better? My roof is insulated with spray foam and the walls with fiberglass bats. Um, all right, so we're in Maine. Summer so, lasts for two weeks yeah. in Maine. <laughs> yeah, so just take a vacation. Yeah. <laughs> Get some central air in that house. Um, spray foam on the... Spray foam... My roof is insulated... Okay, so it's the roof deck is spray foamed and the walls in the house have fiberglass bats. And it's hot and stuffy upstairs. So he's using the, he's using his bathroom exhaust to kind of clear that, I guess, that and that's hot, what, stuffy and air. And that's what we would call exhaust only. Exhaust only. An exhaust only approach, which is not, not the best. Well, and the other sort of the main issue there, I mean, if he's using that thinking that that's going to clear, clear the air out and then bring in what? And where is that right. going? I mean, if you're trying to make your bath or your bedroom cooler, and you're sucking a bunch of bad air out of your bathroom. How yeah. is that solving the issue? It's also way. It's definitely not enough CFM. Right. And oh, maybe yeah. if you're like in a in like an ultra tight house, but if you're in an ultra tight house, I mean, hopefully you have this planned out a little better than mm-hmm. just turning on your bath fan. Uh, so what you're getting at though is that the um, when you turn on an exhaust only system, whether it's a bath fan or a range hood or any of that kind of stuff, it's meant to just clear out air. You don't know where you're pulling air from. Well, you exactly. do. Exactly. Well, you're pulling it around your windows and your door. You know, you're pulling it. All the areas that it ne- 
you might not want to be pulling well, the air from the through I, your basement, through your and that's what I mean. Nasty, you don't know where mouth infested rim joists. You can't <laughs> control where it's coming from. Yeah, uh, a better option. I mean, the the best option would be um, balanced intake and and exhaust system, and that could be a heat recovery ventilator, an energy recovery ventilator. It could be one of those paired systems, like the is the Lunos the paired one. That's what it was. Yeah, I looked into the, the Luno it's, system. Those are really cool. It's like two, they're really compact. It's like two. It looks like like two tubes, really, and one goes in one wall, and one goes in some other wall, and they communicate with each other so that they yeah, open, one opens, they, they open the other at the kind same of time. Here. Yeah, yep. and they provide those are super cool. We're using those in the pro home this year, aren't we? No, no, I think we talked about it. They use them in the past they're versions using a, of it. They're using a Zender HRV. Oh, uh, okay. Um, which is the other cool option? That one is yeah. That the one that. Oh, does Lunos have a heat exchanger? I think it. Uh, you have they an do have ver- of it. they do have versions with heat exchange up to um, like it's like. I thought the efficiency was like super high too, like ninety yeah. something percent. I'm it, sure they don't have the same capacity no. as a sender. You know, like th- those those giant systems. But the the whole point of that supplied balanced air thing is that, or you know, the balanced supply exhaust air is with the heat exchanger is that when the untempered air comes in, whether it be hot or cold, depending on the season it will be tempered and some of that energy is exchanged with the indoor air in order to, to, to alleviate some of that, you know, you don't want to open a window in the middle of winter. Right. And essentially if you have just, you know, but I guess I wonder if that would solve his problem because if it's exchanging the heat and it's already hot up there and he's mm-hmm. bringing in, even if he's bringing in fresh air, it's not going to be substantially cooler. Even if he's bringing it in at night. Well, if the air outside is cool, it will be. Well, it, it'll go down if, but I mean, if you're using an HRV or an ERV, it's not going to go down as much as it would if you just opened a window and put in a fan. Yeah, I'm not familiar enough with how ERVs and HRVs work in terms of can you just have it, can you have it just move air or does it always have to have the exchanger working? I, I think if I it's bl- going through that box, yeah, it'll yeah. be exchanging <laughs> whether you want it to it's, or not. It's yeah. a heat, heat exchanger. <laughs> yeah. 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 I guess you can't just bypass or, it and have a, run it through a filter and just have air flowing through. I, I mean, I think that the way that those bo- those devices, I mean, they're really simple. If you ever opened up and looked at that core, maybe yeah. there's a bypass, but really the whole intent is that you're kind of preconditioning that incoming air with whatever that interior air temperature is, you know? Um, so you're not having to condition that incoming air completely, mm-hmm. whether it's hot, humid, um, or f- freezing. Right. So I don't think it would not work. I think maybe it would just have, it would be less efficient. Yeah, well, that's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah you're yeah. not going to be 100% efficient. Right. For I sure. mean, you'll get, it'll take care of maybe the stuffiness factor, but not so much the hot factor. Right, and hot and stuffy are two different things, right? Uh, I, I tend to think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what are you thinking? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of like the idea of a fan. I mean, if he's trying to stay natural, I mean, you can put a fan uh, that is blowing uh, well, I mean, you can set it up so many different ways, but I mean, you want to get some kind of cross ventilation, I think. So cross maybe, ventilation. Yeah. So I, I mean, I don't know what the orientation of the house is. I don't know if he has windows that uh, he can open to. Are sort you of angling like for a main site visit? <laughs> I, yes, I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, Scott, could, can, can Matt come to your house and and daily and hang out in your bedroom at night to open and close windows? <laughs> yeah, you, you and your wife won't mind, I'm sure. Yeah, I need to map your uh, prevailing winds, and it's going to take a while. Yeah, all summer. Yeah, I feel, I feel like I picture him sailing up there on the coast, like in a in an old galleon or something. Yeah, but I mean... A naturalist. I, I think that's uh, some sort of fan option, you know. I mean, it could be just, you know, big box window fans that you stick in there, I mean, or they have you know, things that you can kind of like fit into the window space or you could have, uh, you know, a situation where maybe you install something permanently in the wall that, you know, just sort of can exchange air, either blow it in or out um, or maybe cycle right. somehow. I mean, it's not a new thing, though, to have an attic fan or like a whole house attic fan. I mean, people have had those for a long time. And and Rob, you were mentioning before we, before we pressed record here that questioning whether that's old technology that we should still be talking about. Um, well, I think it just kind of got into, all right, the ideal of this balance ventilation versus oh, okay. um, exhaust only or passive gotcha. uh, intakes. And uh, yeah, so, I mean, that could, that, uh, that fan could work out in 
certain times of the year and they could be a massive energy penalty in other times of the year if it's not kind of sealed up and insulated properly. Yeah. And energy experts will tell you that if you're going to do this whole house fan thing, you're, you're aiming for 500 to 1,000 CFM for this kind of a situation that Scott's describing, uh, which is way more than your bath fan is going to do. It needs to move a lot of air. And the, the kind of the routine would be um, to button up your upstairs, that's hot stuffy upstairs during the day. You don't want to, you don't want. Yeah. So the way that the stack effect works. And so essentially that, that cooler air that would be coming in at night. The way it works in the summer. In the summer. Yes. Yeah. It's denser. So it'll sink to mm -hmm. the bottom floor of your house. Um, and that hot air, they say hot air rises, that hot air is being displaced by that cool air. So it's, it's more buoyant. Yeah. So that's filling the upper level of your house. And so you want to flush that out essentially um right your, your upstairs is hot because yeah. of the stack effect yeah that's what we're trying to yeah. say so if you open the windows upstairs in the cool evening and you op if you open a first floor window and a, and a second floor window the hot air will naturally flow out the windows and be yes. replaced by cooler air downstairs yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. so you're kind of taking advantage of of physics right thermodynamics something like that yeah. uh, you're taking advantage of some stuff and it's moving <laughs> some air around and things um so you want those windows to be open in the evening. I guess you can close them before you go to bed. I like to sleep with them open. Yeah, depends, I'd leave depends them where open. you live. In Maine, I would leave them open. Leave them open all night and then close them first thing in the morning and close the shades. Yeah, yeah, yeah and then button it up and then yeah. hope yeah. that your insulation is going to do its job. It, and then by the by the nighttime, it'll be hot up there again, probably. And then you open it up again and you get some more fresh air. Now, if it's hot at night that whole house fan is probably not going to do a whole, uh, the, by the way, I, I, I skipped here. The whole house fan is, it's another, it's essentially the same, same thing we're talking about. You can do this naturally with windows and it'll have a certain effect. If you want the next level up, you would have a whole house fan. You do the same deal, turn it on in the evening, mm -hmm. shut it off again, or let it go all night, turn it off during the day. Mm -hmm. Right. But, um, I lost my train of thought. It's gone. Well, I, I think there are a couple different, you know, uh, what was I scenarios saying? with that. Well, you're talking about the whole house fan, but I, I think you were trying to what was get I trying into, to get to <laughs> get into like maybe when what am I doing? when it is that you're supposed to be what when year you is this? use that <laughs> <laughs> when you would close the windows or when you would oh turn well, that what would you off? do if it was still if it was hot outside right oh, um, yeah. that if you had the whole, if you had the whole house fan and it was operating at night and it was hot outside you should understand it's not going to necessarily make you cool. It right. will maybe move some air around and give you a little sense of movement, which is like what a, you know what a ceiling fan essentially does. But it's not like an air conditioner, so don't expect it to be. Mm -hmm. But and, you know, if he's on the coast of Maine, maybe it'll be the perfect solution. Yeah, go for a little swim yeah. in the bay and then sweat it, sweat it out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wait a couple of days; it'll be winter soon. <laughs> yep. Uh, um, okay, that's all we got, and we ha we fired through those things. Wow. Carrie, how far in are we? 49. 49 minutes. That's a solid episode, guys. I think so. <clears throat> so uh, we'll be back next week. Wait, how, did, how do you think Matt did? Ah, Matt did pretty well, Matt, I think. I think he did all right. Why don't you guys send us some emails? Let us know if you want Matt to come <laughs> back on the show or if we should just fire him. Yeah. Uh, that's going to wrap us up for this week. Uh, if you have questions or topics, again, please send them to us. FHBpodcast at taunton.com. Um, and if you like the show, please do help us out with a review on what are you doing? I don't think Poland Springs is a sponsor. Oh, Rob's turning my water bottle around. Uh, if you like the show, help us out with a review on iTunes. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube, click that thumbs up and uh, leave us a comment down below. Until next time, this is Justin for Rob and Matt saying happy building. Happy building.